Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India As we have observed a little while ago, what is crucial in Keynesian economics is not that aggregate supply creates aggregate demand as is what Keynes thought says law to be, but the decision towards expenditure which led to aggregate expenditure which in turn translated itself into aggregate effective demand and which in turn resulted in supply. So, the whole reasoning is kind of reversed by Keynes. So, the heart of the whole analysis is aggregate spending, aggregate expenditure in the economy. And aggregate expenditure is broken down into two components. One component is consumption expenditure and the other component is the investment expenditure. Consumption is said to be a direct function of the levels of income. So, people spend on consumption out of their incomes. So, Keynes defined the psychological factor which led to consumption expenditure as the marginal propensity to consume or in brief MPC. This marginal propensity to consume lay somewhere in the range of 0 to 1. In other words, you could spend all your income or not anything at all. More typically, Keynes assumed that whether people earned money or not, they had a minimum necessity to spend because they needed to live on. So, the marginal propensity to consume varied according to the income, but there was a level of consumption which existed even if the income were to be 0. So, Keynes was thinking in terms of a consumption function or a consumption income relationship, where there was a minimum amount of consumption which was involved even with zero income, but after that consumption increased at a particular fraction of income each time and the fraction was the marginal propensity to consume. So, in this particular diagram, the line C shows the behavior of, behavior of consumption as the level of income goes on expanding. You can see that for every rupee of expansion in income, the expansion is consum in consumption is less than 1 rupee. In other words, marginal propensity to consume is less than 1. So, the slope of C is given by marginal propensity to consume and consumption expenditure expands with income expansion along this slope. So, that is the consumption function. What about investment? Keynes is thinking of investment as autonomous. Autonomous with respect to what? Autonomous with respect to the levels of income prevailing at any point in time. Now, here was a big difference between classical and Keynesian view of looking at investment behavior. According to classical view, investment came out of savings. Savings was based on decision to abstain from consumption. Keynes did not deny this, that Keynes, Keynes did not deny this, that consumption when abstained le from led to savings, absolutely. But what Keynes said was that the limit to investment did not come from savings at any point in time. On the contrary, when people invested money, that gave inducement for people to save. So, a certain fraction of the income which is saved 
response to this inducement and so saving is influenced by the level of investment rather than being the determinant of level of investment as in classical thinking. So, investment is autonomous of income. So, what is inf investment decided upon through in the Keynesian system? In Keynes, there are two factors which influence investment decisions. One is what he calls marginal efficiency of capital and the other of course, is the interest rate that prevails at any point in time. According to Keynes, investors compare the marginal efficiency of capital at any point in time with the interest rates that prevail and they decide upon the volume of investment that they would undertake on that basis. What is the marginal efficiency of capital? Is it the same as the marginal product of capital? We do not know at this point in time, because we do not know enough of Keynesian economics. But certainly, marginal product of capital is very specific. It is a concept which derives out of the behavior of the productivity of capital in industry. <coughs> marginal efficiency of capital is rather different. Marginal efficiency of capital can be defined as the rate of discount which enables us to arrive at the net present worth of future returns from investment. If for instance, if future returns from an investment are 1500 rupees, then there is a particular rate of discount which enables us to arrive at some net present worth which is smaller than 1500 rupees because it is discounted. The rate at which we arrive at this net present worth is the rate of discount of future earnings from our investment and in Keynesian thinking this rate of discount is the same as marginal efficiency of capital. Now, what are the factors that determine this rate of discount? One is of course, technological in the sense that future returns from a given investment are determined by specific technology, which is involved as a part of the investment decision. And this technology would tell us what the returns would be and what, would, what the stream of returns would be over a period of time from a given act of investment today. So, technology is certainly one major factor. However, technology would tell us how much in actual terms would be the return from an investment. For instance, I might invest a 100,000 rupees in a particular machine, which might yield me 1000 rupees per month over the next 20 years. And now, I can discount these returns over 20 years at a particular rate of discount and I can arrive at the net present worth of all my returns and see whether investment of 100,000 rupees is worthwhile or not. As I said, this is a function of the net present worth and the net present worth in turn would be determined by the rate of discount. So, yes, part of the factor influencing the estimate of net present worth and the rate of discount is the technology. However, it is not all technology. There are businessmen and businessmen who are in the market and as businessmen and businessmen think, they think differently. There are some businessmen who are naturally optimistic. There are some businessmen who are not so optimistic, who are more conservative and there are some businessmen who are positively pessimistic, pretty negative, not very convinced about the future of the economy and therefore, not very satisfied about 
how future incomes will translate into net present worth. Whatever you have businessmen and businessmen and therefore, you have states of mind and states of mind in which businessmen function. Here is a sea of subjectivity, different businessmen think differently about the future and therefore, they think differently about the prospects of investment which are taking place today. And as they think differently, the rate at which they discount future earnings, even if they are technologically certainly determined, but the rate at which they discount the future income streams depend upon how they perceive the economy in the future. If they are pessimistic, they think about 200 rupees tomorrow is not the same as even 100 rupees today, much less. On the other hand, if they are optimistic, they tend to have a much more positive view of the future, which again affects their rate of discount. In short, whether you discount your future very much or whether you discount your future only marginally is a function of your state of mind, your level of confidence about the economy and it is very subjective. It is not all technology it is not all productivity. Now, this is the big difference between the Keynesian and pre-Keynesian view of investment. In the pre-Keynesian, the classical view, investment decisions came on the basis of marginal product of capital. If what you had to pay for capital was less than the marginal product of capital, you just went on and invested anyway till such time as the marginal product became at least equal to the reward for capital. But in Keynesian thinking, the marginal product of capital might actually decide the future streams of income, but how the capital investor looked at the future streams of investment was highly subjective. It depended upon his state of mind. It depended upon whether he was a pessimist, an optimist or whether he was just neutral and this varied across the economy. In short, marginal efficiency of capital involved a substantial level of subjectivity, which was completely absent in the estimate of marginal product of capital. Now, this is the most fundamental and the most profound difference between Keynesian investment function and the classical investment function. Now, as a result of this big difference, Keynesian investment function is a lot more than simply an estimate of what, what capital would bring, because Keynesian investment, Keynesian investment function is determined by a whole lot of subjective outlooks. So, what investment might bring actually is very different from what businessmen perceive investments to bring. The returns from investments is looked upon either positively or negatively, either optimistically or pessimistically. In short, the rate at which these returns are discounted is purely a function of the businessman's levels of confidence. These levels of confidence oscillate across through time and across the economy. And this is a very crucial factor which Keynes designates as animal spirits. Animal spirit because it is almost like some very primitive behavioral system, which is non-rational it is not based on any calculations of estimated or probability distributions of returns. No, it is based on purely a hunch, which is a function of purely the levels of confidence which a businessman is feeling. Now, this is a very crucial thing, because as we shall see, this lies at the heart of all kinds of uncertainties in the economy, but that comes later, not now. So, investment is autonomous. 
it is partly determined by the marginal efficiency of capital. Let us do a little more consideration of marginal efficiency of capital. By and large, at any given point of time, you might have the marginal efficiency or the rate of discount being an inverse function of the quantity of investment. In fact, the higher the investment, the lower the rate of discount. So, rate of discount is here, investment level is here. In each of these functions, you find that as investment expands, the rate of discount declines. What Keynes is basically saying is, there is a negative relationship rather inverse relationship between the rate of discount and level of investment. But what is crucial here is also that you re, you see three lines here 1, 2 and 3. Line 1 is what you might call a normal or an average psychology. Then you might have somebody who is a lot more pessimist than this normal or average person who might have a rate of discount which is to the left. So, this is a pessimistic discount function M e c function. This is an optimistic function to the right of the average discount function. In short, what we are thinking here is about the possibility that marginal efficiency of capital might be a shifting function and the shifting is entirely due to subjective factors entirely due to the outlook of the person about the economy. It does not have anything to do with levels of technology, it does not have anything to do with productivities, no it is just the businessman's outlook. So, this is marginal efficiency of capital. At any point of time, the rate of interest in the, in the market is given. So, the equilibrium in investment happens when the rate of interest equals the rate of discount investment level is determined according to the levels of confidence. So, investment is autonomous and happens on the basis of marginal efficiency of capital which is the, which is the rate of discount of future income streams or return streams which as I repeat involves a high level of subjectivity and levels of confidence and which Keynes calls animal spirits, which is at the heart of it all. So, businessmen are not seen to be simply comparing productivities on a blanket format. Businessmen are seen to be people who are looking at the economy as a whole when they invest they look upon the prospects of investment in the economy in the times to come. In short, they are people who are induced strongly by the levels of confidence or animal spirits. This has to be repeated again and again, so that we understand Keynes properly. So, we have in the economy a consumption function, which is determined essentially by levels of income and then we have an investment function which is autonomous of levels of income. For any given level of income, the level of investment is given autonomously and together we have an aggregate expenditure function in the economy. Here we have for example, a consumption function. At this point in time, we have assumed some linearity, so that some simplicity of reasoning is possible. So, we have a standard fraction of income constantly being spent on consumption giving the slope and then we have an autonomous level of investment. So, C plus i is aggregate expenditure in the economy and equilibrium in the economy simply means that aggregate expenditure equals aggregate production and supply this is the point of equilibrium. So, y 1 is equilibrium level of income in the economy, macroeconomic equilibrium happens at income level y 1. De facto 
as a matter of fact, aggregate income equals aggregate expenditure at level Y1. Let us repeat, according to Keynes, this does not necessarily mean full employment equilibrium. It is just some expenditure in the economy, which is matched by production or supply in the economy and that is it. It does not mean at all that it is full employment equilibrium, which also means that it could well be an under employment equilibrium. A certain percentage of the working force might be unemployed if you are generating income levels Y1. So, this is important because we have already said that Keynes distinguished between notional macroeconomic equilibria and actual macroeconomic equilibria. The notional equilibria are say type equilibria where aggregate demand and aggregate supply are equal to lead to full employment, whereas any actual equilibrium would be simply aggregate demand equals aggregate supply at any level of output de facto at any point in time. The level of employment at that time simply determined by the level of output, which in turn means that it might be under employment, it might be full employment. We do not know. This is the situation. So, suppose we find that Y 1 means that a certain fraction of the workforce is unemployed. Let us say at Y 1 some 2 percent, 3 percent, 4 percent of the national workforce is unemployed. You need to generate more demand in the economy in order that production rises sufficiently enough to employ this 3 to 4 percent of currently unemployed workforce. And as we have already seen, the adjustment mechanism in the system is not working, that is what Keynes says. So, the government as a nursemaid has to come in crucially. But before we go into that, I suddenly recall that I need to tell you something more about the investment function. I simply dropped it at that point when I said interest rate, suppose it is given at i, the equilibrium between d and i will give you the level of investment. But what determines interest rate is something which I had not talked to you about at that time. So, let us go into that. Let us spend time, spend some time looking at how interest rate is determined. Now, the crucial difference between classical economics and Keynesian economics is that in classical economics, interest rate is a real phenomenon. In other words, people are foregoing abstaining from current consumption and therefore, they have to be rewarded for abstaining from current consumption. So, the interest rate is a real phenomenon. In other words, if I have to consume 20 percent less than what I wish to and if I am abstaining from 20 percent consumption, then I have to be rewarded. So, the act of saving is real and the reward for it is real. In contrast, in Keynes, interest rate is monetary, it is nominal. Let us look at the difference. In Keynes, interest rate is a function of different parts of the money market. The crucial thing in Keynes is the way he looks at money demand. If we remember in classical theory, neoclassical theory as well, demand for money was demand for cash balances. We may recall that 
demand for cash balances is nothing but demand for a certain fraction of the nominal national income which people needed to perform their transactions and a little bit of precaution taking a little insurance for contingencies. So, cash balance demand was influenced by as I said the need to have transactions conducted and a certain amount of precaution to face contingencies. Now, these two facts of transaction and contingency can persist in Keynesian, look, Keynesian point of view on money demand. Keynes's language for demand for money is liquidity preference, because Keynes says money is the most liquid form of assets. It need not be sold in the market to be converted into liquidity, it is just liquid by itself. If I have a bond or if I have a share or if I have a house property, if I have say a transport, a bus or a truck, I can convert this asset into liquidity by selling it in the market. On the other hand, I need no selling when money, my, my assets are held in money form. So, money is liquid, liquid asset. So, Keynes is asking what creates the demand for liquid assets in human beings, which is the same as demand for money. One, Keynes says, is the transaction demand for money. There are constant needs that people have for conducting transaction. So, a certain fraction of the money that they demand is for transaction purposes. And usually the volume of transaction money is determined by the purchasing power that I have at my hand and how much of it I would like to hold as transaction money. So, by and large transaction demand in modern macroeconomics is looked upon as a function of income levels and in a marginal sense also a function of interest rate on savings accounts, because I can hold my money as a savings account in a bank rather than cash on hand and that would give me some interest earnings too. So, interest on savings accounts and income levels are considered as two determinants of transaction demand. Precautionary demand is my perception of uncertainty, is my perception of contingencies and therefore, it is not a function of income, it is more externally determined than simply income. In a measure, I can hold my money in savings account even for precautionary purposes and draw them out when I need. So, savings account interest rates are considered in a measure as determinants of precautionary demand for liquidity. However, the demand for liquidity arises in a much stronger way when money is looked upon not as some kind of a cash balance, but as an asset. In short, if we look upon money as any other like any other asset which can yield returns then money acquires very different meanings. Let us look at this. If I do not have money in my hand, if I do not hold my assets in the form of liquidity, then I have to hold it in non-liquid forms, which is say some bond or some equity. Now, in order to hold my money in a non-liquid form, I need some incentive, do I or not? This incentive is what is known as non-liquidity premium. In it is a premium I need to hold my assets in a non-liquid form and usually returns on bonds or returns on shares, these returns are the premium for holding money in non-liquid forms. By and large, by and large as bond prices fluctuate, the return from bonds fluctuate in opposite direction. 
if a bond gives me 10 rupees return for every 100 rupee face value, then as the market value of the bond increases beyond 100 rupees, then this 10 rupee return becomes a lot less than 10 rupees, does not it. Similarly, when the market value of this bond falls to something less than 100 rupees, then I find that the 10 rupee return is worth more than 10 rupees. In short, a return on investment of assets varies inversely with the price of assets. What is important is to see that interest rates as proxy for return on assets vary inversely with the price of assets. As at asset prices rise, I might be hoping that the asset prices might rise a little bit more and might buy some assets. If, if for instance, a bond face value 100 rupees is now selling at 105 rupees <coughs> and if my instinct and gut level feeling about the market tells me that it is going to appreciate a little bit more then I might like to buy this bond expecting to make, it, make, it, make a little pocket money by selling it at the time when it is selling at 110. So, I make a 5 buck margin, which margin is very often called capital gains. So, the motivation to make capital gains is a very serious motivation when people are playing with assets when they are converting their liquid assets into non-liquid assets and back, the possibility of capital gains figures significantly. In short, there is a new demand for money in this context, which does not arise out of transactionary motive, which does not arise out of precautionary motive but which arises out of the desire in people to make capital gains. In short, people are speculating and Keynes says one of the most important sources of liquidity preference in modern capitalist economies, market economies is this desire for speculation in people. People are congenital gamblers and therefore, as returns on assets, as the price of assets vary, people would like to invest, buy and sell assets according to how they judge the market to be and make capital gains. Speculative motive constitutes according to Keynes, the central motivation in liquidity preference in modern times. What is crucial is to note that people tend to buy when they expect to make capital gains, they tend to sell when they expect to lose money and therefore, lose capital gains. So, when asset prices are rising, interest rates are falling, asset prices are falling, interest rates are rising. Usually, according to Keynes, therefore, the speculative demand for money is associated with this movement of interest rates. The higher the interest rate, the higher speculative demand for money. It simply means that if the interest rates are higher, it simply means asset prices are dropping and people try to get rid of assets and convert them into liquidity. So, liquidity preference from a speculative point of view is higher when interest rates are higher, which is the same as saying asset prices are dropping. So, there is an inverse correlation between speculative demand for money and interest rate. At any point of time, the three sources of demand for money add up to give you an aggregate demand for money the precautionary, transactionary and speculative demand give you an aggregate demand for money, with speculative demand constituting the majority in this. So, 
given the speculative demand as a predominant element of liquidity preference and given money supply at any point of time in the economy as being given at some value by the government, the equilibrium between aggregate demand and aggregate supply in the money market gives you the equilibrium interest rates. And so, now we know how interest rates are determined. We know now that interest rates are purely monetary phenomena and they are determined by the behavior of liquidity preference within a framework of asset demand and supply as a result of the comparison of interest rates so determined and the marginal efficiency of capital based on the subjectivity of the investor, you have the level of investment decided in the economy, so autonomous. So, now we know everything about investment function. We had left out interest rate, now we brought in invest interest rates and saw how interest rates were determined. So, let us get back to this program of moving away from underemployment. If you recall, we were talking of Y1 here as a level of income involving a certain amount of underemployment in the economy, maybe 2 percent, 3 percent, 4 percent of the workers are unemployed. And the government does not like it, it is very uncomfortable. Not only does it have to spend a lot of money on unemployment benefits, but also is politically un insecure more unemployed people in the economy would mean more insecurity for the government. So, it is politically undesirable to have unemployment in the economy. Whatever the government wants to get rid of unemployment, this 2 percent, 3 percent, 4 percent. And the only way to get rid of unemployment is to generate jobs. And generating jobs simply means that firms and industries will have to start expanding their production. And production will not expand unless there is demand for the products and demand does not happen unless there is decision towards expenditure. So, the government has to create expenditure in the economy hoping that this would multiply itself till such time as unemployment is wiped out. Let us assume that the government in this particular case is going to create an expenditure G in a very typically Keynesian fashion. We may assume that the government is employing people to dig holes on the roads and the next day fill up the holes with mud and dig holes again on the third day in some other place, fill it up again on the fourth day with more mud. So, gainfully employed in the sense that they are getting a wage at the end of the day. So, let us say the expenditure G is incurred by the government in this process of employing people gainfully, making them dig holes and fill them up and getting them to earn at the end of the day and more important to spend at the end of the day. So, what is happening here is that the government is spending some amount of money G in what is called public works, in this public works policy. You remember the treasury view said this would not do and Keynes is saying this of course, is the only thing which will do or at least one of the things that it that will do. So, let us see how it works. The government spends G which is say some 200 thousand rupees on employing people towards public works. At the end of the day, these workers go back home or rather they go to the shops on the way back home and buy up food and other things of necessity worth 200,000 rupees, which is what they earned that day. So, the, the entire expense of G or 200,000 which the government has incurred is spent on day 1. Day 2, perhaps another 200,000 coming up. But more important, the 200,000 spent on day 1 is starting to create its own flutter. The retailers who sold these workers the necessities on 
day one have now placed orders for more inventory with the producers. So, the producers have now started recruiting workers who can be employed to produce 200,000 rupees more worth of goods. On day three, the newly recruited workers, they start getting paid and they spend money according to their propensity to consume. In short, what has happened is the initial 200,000 gets translated into many rounds of expenditure. It multiplies itself. See, there is a movement here from Y1 to Y2 because of an expenditure G. So, the aggregate expenditure in the economy here moves up from C plus I to C plus I plus G, where G is the government spending on public works and C plus I plus G enables the economy from move from Y1 to Y2. Look at the small amount of G leading to a larger amount of expansion in the economy Y1, Y2. Now, this is multiplier. It simply means that a certain amount of investment by the government in public works multiplies itself to an additional expenditure in the economy. And if Y2 is full employment level of income, the government policy has solved the problem. It has helped you to move from Y1, which is under employment equilibrium, to Y2, and that has happened due to a given expenditure D multiplying itself at some particular rate to lead you to Y2. And what is this rate? We find that the multiplier is defined as 1 upon 1 minus marginal propensity to consume MPC or 1 upon marginal propensity to receive MPS. What it simply means is that if I am saying 1, saving 1 out of every 5 rupees that I get, which is my MPS, this little fraction will tell me that if my MPS is 1 upon 5, then multiplier is 5. If my propensity to save is 1 out of every 5 additional rupees, then the rate at which a given government expenditure will multiply is by 5. So, each rupee will multiply 5 fold, which is why you find this expansion here. So, Keynesian reasoning is very clear here. Public spending is very crucial. How does the government involve itself in public spending? It can do it either through what is known as open market operations, which is simply borrowing from public or rather not borrowing from public, but buying and selling of bonds. The government can simply sell bonds to the public and raise the money required for G, open market operations. Alternatively, it can take an, in the Indian case, there used to be a practice of central governments taking overdraft with the Reserve Bank of India to finance more printing of money. So, it could be an overdraft. In short, the government could lead to more spending in the economy, essentially through a deficit in the budget. So, government increase in government spending is the way through which the G is financed, which leads to a multiplier here. So, increase in government spending or a fiscal policy, a budgetary policy is what is the instrument involved in public works project. Now, the government need not simply have a fiscal policy for expansion the government could operate through a monetary policy as well. The government could operate through a monetary policy by expanding money supply in the economy. It can do it in a number of ways. The government can for instance, announce that it is reducing the statutory reserve ratio in the banks. That means, the banks need to hold less reserve for issuing of credit in the economy, which simply means that the credit level in the economy will expand with lower reserves. And expansion of credit in the economy would create an expansion in the economy. It is equivalent to an increase in money supply. 
the government can also reduce the rate at which it lends money to commercial banks through the central bank. When that happens that the commercial banks lower their lending rates to the public, which leads to an increased demand for investment funds, investment expands. So, a monetary policy enables investment to expand by creating this interest rate moving movement up and down given a particular demand for liquidity, given a stock of money, interest rate policies or reserve rate policies could cause interest rate movements up and down which in turn would lead to monetary induced expansion in the economy. The fiscal and monetary policy are two crucial instruments in the Keynesian system through which the government can push an economy from, a, from an underemployment situation to a full employment situation. So, this is the heart of it all the government as the nursemaid as we have stated in the beginning and this is how the nursemaid nurses the economy into well being the two crucial policy instruments fiscal and monetary policy. There has been substantial interest in the way these policies have worked over time. In the 1950s for instance after the second world war most of the European governments even the United States were involved in using monetary policy not so much in order to induce expansion in the economy, but in, in order to ensure that interest rates remain stable. So, the purpose of monetary policy in the 1950s Europe was mainly to ensure stability of interest rates, so that investment could be stable and economies could be stably expanding. In the 1960s, the US government and then subsequently in the 70s other European countries too went into big deficits. In the 1960s the US government went into deficit on two grounds. One under the presidentship of Lyndon Johnson there was a substantial growth in public spending by the US government which created its multiplier effect and created a pressure of increased money supply in the US economy. And in the late 60s, the government in US started increasing expenditure of money to finance its war in Vietnam. These two factors led to a pronounced inflationary pressure in the US economy. So, at that time onwards, any faith in growth in public spending became discounted. In 1970s onwards, by and large most governments in the US and in Europe started becoming more and more cynical of Keynesian solutions. It was a rise of an alternative approach to macroeconomics about which I shall not be able to speak to you here, monetarism. The 1970s and 80s was an era of growing popularity of monetarism principally and monetarism as a school of thought principally under the leadership of Milton Friedman of Chicago. However, more generally a decline of Keynesian economics was a very crucial factor of those days. Today in US there is a re-emphasis on big public spending under President Obama. The huge recession which the US economy has been facing is now meeting a standard Keynesian solution wherein Obama is attempting to spend money in order for the economy to recover an almost typically Keynesian multiplier based solution. Whatever the world has seen fluctuating interest in Keynes and Keynesian macroeconomics since the time he published the general theory. But the heart of the matter is this, the way people look at economics has changed since Keynes published general theory. People no longer believe in any automatic adjustment mechanisms. People believe that policy is a crucial instrument in the economy in ensuring stability. Now, how significant which policy is, is very important. 
For instance, monetarists believe that fiscal policy solutions towards imbalances is usually not operative effectively in the long run and ineffectively and variedly in the short run. They believe that the crucial thing is for governments to maintain a rate of growth of money supply matching rate of growth of the economy to maintain stability, whatever it is. Towards the end of the class, you can say this, that the advent of Keynes brought in a change in the universals in economics, in the world view of economics and that is important. Good evening.